This isn't the whole Cape Cod, this is a little tiny part of it. Um, this is right across this uh, bay is uh, Massachusetts, and then beyond that is Rhode Island, which is where Brown University is located. It was only an hour and 15 minute drive for me from Brown University to the Marine Biological Lab, which is these clusters of buildings. The Marine Biological Lab has a boat right here, which um, is called the Gemma, that goes out and fishes for squid. The squid are there from May until November sometimes. They look like this. They're called Lalago, the long fin squid of the North Atlantic. After November, it goes somewhere, and we don't know where. People have tagged it. They shed the tag or they die. So we haven't been able to follow where these squid go in the winter. And those of us who have tried to work with squid have no squid to work with from November until May. <laughs> this may seem really hard because Science is trying to move very fast right now. And journal editors will say, how come it took you so long? And we would say, well, we can only work half time on this project. But at any rate, they're very beautiful organisms. Um, and they have this wonderful biological thing. They have a giant axon. And it starts, this is the squid eye, which is beautiful. It looks like a human eye. And behind it is a, is a ganglion. And behind it is not much of a brain. It's more like a ganglion. But this large ganglion behind the eye projects an axon that runs seven centimeters along the squid body. It's a single axon. It's a millimeter in diameter. Now for us, our axons are a micron or less in diameter. So this is a thousand times bigger in, in diameter. And here it is. It's being held by one of my graduate students. It's translucent. And he's squeezing the axoplasm into this drop of buffer. So it's visible. So we can manipulate it in the lab. We can see it, we can dissect it, we can move it around, and we can inject it. The process of transport was understood by, um, by two groups, almost simultaneously. They used differential interference microscopy, which is a new, was a new type of microscopy, and they coupled it to computers and to visual monitors, and they were able to see things that had never been seen before. As you can see, there's packets of something moving back and forth. And when they teased apart this axon, I can find my little, they saw that these, these packets, or what we now call organelles, were moving back and forth on filamentous structures. One group thought those structures were actin, and another group thought they were microtubules. And they went at it in a, in a very aggressive competition in which one side won and the other side lost. And they still aren't speaking to each other 20 years later. <laughs> yeah, we, some of us in this room know who that is. Yes. Um, okay. So, um, so, so they, it turns out that they were moving on microtubules. And one of the members of the of the group who won is Ron Fail, who founded his lab at the University of California, San Francisco, on this protein that he identified as the motor that moves these organelles along the microtubule. <coughs> so this is the kinesin. We called it kinesin, which is a Greek word. He got from the Greeks, meaning movement. And he has, just, he has spent most of his career studying the head domain. It's called the head domain. It looks round. Because this is the duty end. This is the part of the, mi of the motor that binds to this microtubule and mediates force to carry things along. And I've shown this video to graduate students almost every year, and I ask them, what's missing from this picture? And, and it's very rare that anybody gets it. Does anybody here want to take that challenge? What's missing? Here's a motor walking along a microtubule. What's missing? The, OK, the fuel's there is the ATP. What about this end? Oh, the cargo. There's no cargo, right? <laughs> There's no cargo. Exactly right. So um, it turned my, uh, none of the folks working on this motor duty cycle um, have done anything to discover the cargo. Uh, there was some early um, efforts made, and they did not turn out to be accurate, and the project was dropped. So we started looking at cargo. How does ca you can't carry anything if you're a motor if you can't find a cargo. So how do you do that? And we thought, well, how would, might that happen? There might be some signal on the cargo that binds to the motor, and maybe there's an adapter. So this is a very simple hypothesis. 
and we decided to test it by using the herpes virus. The prediction is that 85% of you in this room are infected with this virus. Once you have herpes, you have it for life. It travels from the cold sore on your lip back up to the trigeminal ganglion, which lives right outside the brain. These ganglion cells project second processes right into the brain. The reason the, the cold sore comes back is because as the virus wakes up, comes back, and makes another cold sore on your lip. And that happens when the virus is triggered by a fever, too much UV light, anything that produces tumor necrosis factor, which is a growth factor that the virus uses to wake up. So the virus can cause a recurrent cold sore. What we think of that as a nuisance. So it's hard to get funding to study herpes virus. In people with HIV, it's not just a nuisance on the lip. It can also happen in the eye. And it causes blindness when there's a recurrent sore on the eye. There's a scar. And, and the, uh, you can see that this person's uh, pupil is not concentric anymore. And that means that the light coming into his eye doesn't project on his retina in the right way. So we, we were interested in the virus because it can go back and forth in this neuron. So we thought, the virus knows how to do it. We don't know how it's done, but the virus knows how to do it. So let's use the virus as a tool to figure out how cargo moves back and forth inside neurons. And we use the squid axon to do this. We labeled the virus with a green fluorescent protein. And all around you in this exhibit, you have seen wonderful pictures of what green fluorescent protein can do when it's linked to other cellular or viral proteins. So we, linked, we put green fluorescent protein on the virus. We isolated the virus, injected it into the axon. Now this is really a crazy experiment. And my friend from UCSF who came to collaborate with me on this kept saying, this is really too crazy. I think we're going to spend the summer on the beach. It's not going to work. And the first time we injected it, it worked. So we have a human herpes virus and a squid, a marine mollusk, that we've injected this human herpes virus into, and it moved in the axon. And this is one of our very first movies. This is before we had pseudo-colored confocals. So this is a confocal microscope looking deep into an axon. And you're not looking at all those normal endogenous particles. Instead, you're looking at the fluorescent signal from the labeled herpes virus. We had stripped it with um, detergent, and so it didn't have an envelope. And it moved at 2.2 microns per second, which is really fast, back towards where the squid axonal nucleus should be, but we'd cut it off. So the virus had nowhere to go, really. This was so relentless and so reproducible, it was like love. This virus wanted to get to a nucleus, which is where it replicates. So I had a very talented graduate student who said, well, what if we leave the envelope on? Let's take the virus out of cells, leave the envelope on. It should go anterograde. And indeed, she did see viral particles going anterograde. So there's two right there. I think, I don't know if I can play that again. It was supposed to play twice. Let me see if I can get it again. It's right here. There it goes. But you notice there's a lot of particles that aren't going anywhere. So it seems like it needs something special to go anterograde, whereas to go retrograde, it was like love. It was reproducible. It was every time. So um, we thought there must be something special about some of these particles. They have something that takes them anterograde. And um, through a lot of uh, uh, coincidences that I'm not going to describe, my graduate student came up with the idea that it might be amyloid precursor protein. So what is amyloid precursor protein? Amyloid precursor protein is the protein that when it makes, when it aggregates and makes plaques causes this disease. And it makes the human brain look like this instead of like that. And as you can see, this human brain has a very thinned cortex and a huge ventricle and has lost a lot of brain mass because the neurons are dying. So these are, these are the A beta plaques, and if we looked in my pathology microscope, we would see an, um, uh, a xenon plaque here, stained with our standard hematoxin and eosin stain. And if we stain with silver, we would see that this is a neuritic plaque with amyloid precursor protein piled up here and abnormal neural processes aggregated around it. So this is what happens in, in Alzheimer's disease, and here we have herpes virus possibly interacting with this protein. It's actually taken us seven years to prove that. 
and our paper came out yesterday. So, and it's in a <laughs> it's in public library science. So, you, any, everybody in this room has access to this paper, and you can look at the videos. You can download the videos, and some of those are ones I'm going to show you now. So. Um, I had another um, very talented person in the lab, Shibin Chang, whose picture will appear on the next slide. And he did comparable imaging of viral particles inside cells, and he's, he's triple stained them. Green for the capsid, which is the central part of the virus, and red for amyloid precursor protein, and blue for a viral envelope protein. And he counted how many, ha how many viral particles that were stained green on their capsid were co-localized with APP in this kind of configuration. And he found more than 80% of them inside cells. And then in collaboration with Paul Webster at the House Ear Institute, we, I did immunogold, and these are viral particles seen at very high magnification. This is a 100 nanometer um, bar. And this is a capsid of the virus. This is the virus membrane. And then on the outside of that is a cellular membrane decorated with gold. And here's a higher magnification, the capsid, the viral envelope, and the cellular membrane decorated with gold that indicated the presence of APP. And this is a control just showing that we could stain with the same things if we didn't have an APP antibody there, we didn't get any gold. So we feel very confident that the virus is interacting with APP, but we wanted to be absolutely sure because antibodies can give you false results. So we labeled APP with red fluorescent protein and HSV um, caps it with green fluorescence protein and we did video imaging of cells that were expressing both of these and we watched the yellow particles are viral particles that have APP on them. This is the cell nucleus. There's lots of capsids being made here and some of those capsids even are interacting with amyloid precursor protein which should never be in the nucleus. So um, this nuclear membrane has probably been um, broken, has had some other membranes break through. And we can go to higher magnification and watch these two things interact. And you can see that viral particle here interacting with the red APP. And maybe there's even two viral particles together in there. And this is the nucleus of this infected cell. And here's another high magnification video where you see here's going to be the nucleus. Here's the cytoplasm with all the APP in it. You see a viral particle come out of the nucleus and then run out to the end of the cell here. Um, and it kind of goes in and out. Here it is again. And there's another one here. So this live imaging, just like Scott Fraser showed yesterday with his, foot, his wonderful football um, images, without looking live, we would never really know if those two things were actually together. But now, not only do we know that they're together, but they travel together, which is very interesting. The other thing um, Shibin Chen found was that when a cell was infected with HSV, the amyloid precursor protein went to the wrong places in the cell. It no longer went to do its regular job. It went all over the cell. It was much more highly expressed. So there's something about herpes virus that influences the amyloid precursor protein. Other people in Europe have started looking at whether amyloid precursor protein, which needs to be broken down to make plaques, is broken down at a greater degree when the cells are infected with herpes virus. And two labs have now shown that that indeed does happen. Oh, and there's Shibin, but you can't see him very well. That's too bad. There he is. Oops, you better go. Oh, well, I think he's in the last slide, too. So, um, so here we have this thing. Here's the herpes virus, and it has this cellular membrane around it that contains amyloid precursor protein. It affects the, the lip cells, and then it comes out of the lip, it's, it's replicated in the lip cells, and it comes out of them, gets picked up by a neuron, and travels back in this, without its envelope, back to the neuronal cell body, which is in that ganglion just outside of the brain, and then it gets replicated and goes back out. And at that point is when it picks up the APP. But when it starts going back out, what's keeping it from going this way, back into the brain? Because this is the structure of that neuron. So one of the reasons I went to Caltech to start learning um, uh, magnetic resonance imaging was to be able to look at how this herpes virus thing works. And we haven't got there yet after uh, six years. So maybe just need one more year.